Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. 2017 is over, and boy, was it a busy and exciting year of space discoveries and space flight. So, it's officially time for the best space moments of 2017, aka the world famous Astro Awards! Astro -Awards. This is nothing official other than things I thought were awesome from 2017, but I also took into account your opinions from polls here on YouTube and on Twitter. So make sure you're paying attention to those if you want to have a voice in next year's Astro Awards. So, without further ado, may I present to you the 2017 Astro Awards. Hello and good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the first annual Astro Awards, the night of the biggest stars. Yes, even including UY Scuddy and Beetlejuice and VY Canis Majoris and yes, even NML Signy made it. Wow, they look so beautiful, don't they? Each year, we pick our favorite space moments and award the winner the much coveted Leo Trophy, which totally isn't an old weird Soviet lamp I got off eBay. Now, before we start the countdown, we do have one honorable mention. And that goes to Falcon Heavy. Of course, I had to mention Falcon Heavy because of the fact that we finally saw it out on the launch pad at the end of 2017, as it prepares for its inaugural flight in 2018. Since it hasn't flown yet, it didn't get a place on our 2017 list, but I'll bet his flight will be hard to beat for 2018. I recently did a video all about Falcon Heavy. If you haven't checked that out, make sure you do because it gives you a good history of why it took five years for Falcon Heavy to come online and all the things we hope to see on the inaugural flight. Good luck SpaceX, we're all cheering for you for 2018. Number seven. So starting with number seven on my list, I'm going with the first launch from historic launch pad 39A since 2011 after the last space shuttle took off. SpaceX leased pad 39A on April 14th, 2014. A day I'll always remember because I was there. And yes, I even got a selfie with SpaceX president Gwen Shotwell. SpaceX spent almost three years preparing pad 39A to launch both their Falcon 9 rocket and their upcoming Falcon Heavy rocket. The mission that inaugurated the new launch pad was CRS-10, a commercial resupply mission for NASA to send cargo to the International Space Station. It took off on February 19th, 2017 at 9.39 a.m. local time. This mission was cool for a few reasons. Not only was it the first time SpaceX launched from this hollowed ground, it was also the first time we saw a rocket land back at the launch site in broad daylight, which was just amazing. The completely successful mission was a good sign of things to come for SpaceX, as it was the return to flight of their Falcon 9 rocket after that Amos 6 anomaly that destroyed their other launch pad, LC-40, that happened on September 1st, 2016. SpaceX continued to have an outstanding year, launching a record-breaking 18 flawless missions, including a perfect landing record with 14 successful landings out of 14 14 attempts with their Falcon 9 rocket. So congrats on a highly successful year, SpaceX. Number six. On February 15th, 2017, India launched their Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, for mission C-37, which successfully carried 104 satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. The 714 kilogram or 1,574 pound primary satellite, known as Cardosat-2D, was successfully deployed, followed by 103 nanosatellites, weighing in at around six kilograms each. The reason why I find this launch so significant is the fact that India was able to successfully perform such a flawless mission and at an incredibly low cost of only 15 million US dollars. That's incredible. So great job India and ISRO, I can't wait to see more from you. Number five. Next up, we have a truly exciting observation. The first confirmed observation of a known interstellar object passing through our solar system. In October 2017, Robert Work discovered 1I 2017U1 using the Pan-STARRS telescope at the Halakala Observatory in Hawaii. At first, this long cigar-shaped object was thought to be a comet, and then later an asteroid. But after further observation, its trajectory and speed made scientists conclude that it originated from outside our solar system. It's relatively small, only about 230 by 35 meters or 800 by 100 feet in size. After its initial discovery, scientists trained several other telescopes on it, including Keck 2 telescope and even Hubble and Spitzer space telescopes joined in the fun. 1I 2017U1 was later named Omamwa, which is Hawaiian for first scout. 
as a nod to the first confirmed encounter with an object from outside our own solar system. Number four. For my number four, we have another exciting observation. On August 17th, 2017, scientists made the first ever observation of both light and gravitational waves from a single cosmic event. This was one of the most exciting cosmic events, known as a kilonova, and that only happens when two neutron stars collide. Neutron stars are the leftover dense cores from supernovas. Two neutron stars colliding is thought to be super rare, and despite this, it was observed through gravitational waves by the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, in the US, and the Virgo interferometer in Italy, as well as visible light from dozens of observatories. Unlike merging black holes, which also produce detectable gravitational waves, merging neutron stars produce visible light, x-rays, and gamma rays, so we were able to collect a lot more data using several different instruments. This observation is unprecedented, not only for confirming a kilonova, but for also having so many solid observations of it. Best of all, this confirmed that neutron star collisions create the heavy elements like gold and platinum. It's fantastic when direct observations confirm a hypothesis. So congrats to all those involved in this incredible observation. Number three. Now, the next three I had a really hard time deciding between, but just hear me out. Number three goes to the total solar eclipse of 2017. Yeah. On August 21st, 2017, millions of people across the entire continental United States had the opportunity to see a total solar eclipse. The path of totality, or when the moon totally blocks out the sun, took a little tour across the United States. It started at 1019 AM Pacific time in Madras, Oregon, and made its way east until the last bit of totality was seen at 246 PM Eastern in Georgetown, South Carolina. It was truly a magical experience. I think the only way I can describe it is it felt like it united everyone together to all celebrate in something much bigger than all of us. Everyone from every walk of life put aside their differences and all wound up cheering up into the sky as it went dark. People are going nuts. This cosmic coincidence was incredible. And I think I'm addicted to solar eclipses. This experience made me wonder what would an eclipse look like from space? So I found out the answer and I made this video. So check it out if you're interested. Thanks for the fun time, sun and the moon. Hopefully I'll get a chance to see you guys dance together again in 2019 in South America. Number two. Now for our semi-finalists, we need to take a moment and reflect on the loss of a very dear friend of ours. This year, after 20 years in space, the Cassini spacecraft took its final breaths into the atmosphere of Saturn. After a successful liftoff on October 15, 1997 on board a Titan 4B rocket, the Cassini probe flew off with its brother Huygens to explore the Saturn system. It took seven years to get to Saturn, but Cassini went to work right away. Its prime mission lasted four years and was so successful it got extended twice. Cassini was a flagship NASA mission that brought Saturn into much more detail than ever before. The plucky spacecraft detailed maps of Saturn's gravity and magnetic fields, observed Saturn's rings up close and personal, sampled icy ring particles, and collected over 635 gigabytes of valuable data. In total, Cassini executed 2.5 million commands, orbited Saturn 294 times, flew by Saturn's moons 162 times, and took 453,048 photos. It even discovered two new oceans, one on Titan and the other on Enceladus. Through its life, 3,948 scientific papers were published from its findings. Cassini represents everything we love about flagship NASA missions. Plan for four years, Get back 13 jam-packed years of fruitful data. With Cassini on its last puffs of propellant, NASA didn't want to risk having it accidentally collide into a potentially life-harboring moon. So, in April 2017, the Wonder Probe performed a final flyby of Titan, which placed it on a collision course with Saturn that unfolded over the next five months of daring dives between Saturn and its rings. It plummeted into Saturn's thick atmosphere, so it would burn up on entry. On September 15th, 2017, at 7.55 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we heard the last signal from our beloved Cassini. Cassini, you'll be forever missed and your data will be treasured for generations to come. Congrats to the thousands of people who were involved with making Cassini such a massively successful mission. Number one. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. The best moment of space for 2017 goes to... SpaceX and SES-10 in the first reflight of an orbital class booster. Yay! Whoa! 
whoa, 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 hold on, you say. Stop the presses. Am I really suggesting that a Falcon 9 rocket delivering a pretty standard communication satellite is really more important than a flagship 20-year-long flawless NASA mission that gave us data to comb over for decades to come? Well, before I get into a rant about it, let me catch you up to snuff on why SpaceX's reflight of a booster is a really, really big deal. On March 30th, 2017, SpaceX launched a 5,200 kilogram satellite for their customer, SES. This launched from Launchpad 39A in Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission was pretty run of the mill. Everything went perfectly fine and SpaceX even managed to recover the booster. So why was this such a big deal? For this mission, SES-10, it was the second time SpaceX used this exact first stage booster, also known as Core 21. Previously, it launched a Dragon cargo capsule containing the Bigelow beam module and other supplies to the International Space Station on the CRS-8 mission for NASA on April 16th, 2016. It reached 6,600 kilometers an hour, or 3,700 miles an hour, before it separated from the upper stage and then proceeded to land downrange on the autonomous spaceport drone ship named Of Course I Still Love You. For the SES-10 mission, it reached an even faster 8,200 kilometers an hour, or just over 5,000 miles an hour, before separating from the upper stage and once again landing downrange on the drone ship. This thing's about as tall as a 15-story building. It's going over 5,000 miles an hour at the edge of space and ends up landing on something about the size of a football field in the middle of the ocean. It's just incredible. Getting things into space is expensive. Rockets are incredibly engineered, made from the most high-tech and precise parts. And yet, tragically, after only two to three minutes of use, the biggest portion of the rocket has traditionally been discarded. It falls back to Earth, only to become a future coral reef. So, when SpaceX began to pursue recovering and reusing the first stage of their Falcon 9 rocket, it was simply thought to be impossible. Most people in the industry laughed at the idea, literally. It had been the consensus among the industry that recovering a booster was too hard, if not impossible. So you can imagine how game-changing it was when SpaceX not only started to recover booster after booster, but then when they successfully reflew one, the game had officially changed. Not only that, but SpaceX ended up reflying five boosters in 2017. That was more than a quarter of their launches for the year. You might get sick of hearing this, but it's true. Imagine how expensive a standard airline ticket would be if after every single flight they had to throw away the entire jumbo jet. SpaceX already has the cheapest launch costs in the industry by streamlining manufacturing and by making almost every bit of the vehicle in-house. But now by reusing those multi-million dollar pieces of hardware, the cost of getting things into space will start to plummet. In the near future, customers launching payloads into space won't have to buy an entire rocket, they'll just have to buy a ride. They'll essentially be renting the booster for much cheaper than the cost of the brand new rocket. This will revolutionize the space industry. The access to space is still insanely cost prohibitive, but what if the cost comes down by two times? What about by five times, by 10 times? What about a hundred times? Bringing the cost of space down is the first step to making space exploration more routine and attainable. So when the cost of putting a new satellite, a new scientific probe, or even an astronaut is almost an afterthought, Imagine how much more activity will take place among the stars. As you know from the previous segment, Cassini was phenomenal. It was absolutely incredible and I love everything it did for us. But wouldn't it be really sad if the best space moment of 2017 was the death of a beloved space probe? So I choose to look forward to the future. A future where putting Cassini class probes happen often because we can more easily afford to do it. When more people than ever before are heading to space to work and visit. A future where the general public is so enamored by all the brilliant scientific discoveries that we all want to invest as society into exploring deeper into our own solar system. To me, bringing the cost of space down is the ultimate paradigm shift that will open up entirely new economies. It will usher in the future we've all been dreaming about and inspire new generations of explorers. It will lead the way for humankind to step beyond our blue sphere return to the glory days of Apollo and go beyond to Mars, and further on to the gas giants, where the moons hold vast resources that we can then use to venture to interstellar space and go beyond our solar system. For this reason, generations to come will see 2017 as another turning point in space exploration. Ladies and gentlemen, a new Apollo era is upon us. Reusable rockets are here, and it's time to go forward and explore. So, what do you think about the first ever Astro Awards? What missions or events did I forget about that you can't believe I left out? 
or what events are you looking forward to in 2018? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure you're subscribed so you can take upcoming polls for future videos and hit that little bell to make sure you don't miss any upcoming live streams. Don't forget, I live stream SpaceX launches starting about T minus 30 minutes before liftoff, so come ask questions and join the conversation live. A big, huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make this and other everyday astronaut content possible. I owe a special thanks to those patrons in our Discord channel who helped me script and research. If you want to help contribute, please visit patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Thank you. Don't forget to check out my web store for shirts, hats, mugs, prints, original artwork, and lots of other fun stuff at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And as always, all the music in my videos is original. Yes, I even wrote the score for the Astro Awards for whatever stupid reason. Feel free to check out and download my other music for free at soundcloud.com slash everydayastronaut. Tell a friend. Thanks everybody, that does it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.